Did you know there are eight entries in the Leprechaun horror comedy film series? Seriously, eight. And Hollywood is absolutely working on a reboot. But does the magical miniature murder machine portrayed by Warwick Davis in all but two of the Leprechaun films line up with what we find in Irish folklore? Or is the folkloric Leprechaun more akin to the happy-go-lucky American serial mascot? And while we're on the subject, where do Leprechauns come from? And what does the word Leprechaun mean? The answers might surprise you. Let's start with the basics. What is a leprechaun? I mean, is it a type of elf, a dwarf, a little old man? While you'll often find such terms included in dictionary definitions of leprechaun, the reality is that those are merely descriptions of what leprechauns look like. And of course I'm using the word reality here very loosely. Because as far as we know, leprechauns are imaginary beings. Or if they do exist, we certainly do not have indisputable evidence of their existence. And no, that pile of animal bones you saw at that Irish pub that one time does not count as indisputable evidence. Imaginary or not, leprechauns exist in the Irish folk tales and fairy tales that have been passed down for centuries. And based on the characterizations found in those stories, I propose the following concise definition for leprechaun. A leprechaun is a solitary Irish fairy, characterized by its short stature, habitual shoemaking and mischief making, and its immense wealth, which typically takes the form of crocs of hidden treasure. As solitary fairies, which puts them in the same category as the Chloricon and the Fardarig, leprechauns are withered, old, and, quote, in every way unlike the sociable spirits, or trooping fairies. They dress with all unfairy homeliness and are, indeed, most sluttish, slouching, jeering, mischievous phantoms, end quote. This according to W.B. Yeats's 1888 book, Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry. D.R. McNally Jr. elaborates on the physical appearance of the leprechaun in his 1888 book, Irish Wonders, noting, quote, He, the leprechaun, is of diminutive size, about three feet high, and is dressed in a little red jacket, or roundabout, with red breeches buckled at the knee, gray or black stockings, and a hat cocked in the style of a century ago over a little, old, withered face, end Quote. McNally also specifies that the leprechaun will typically wear an Elizabethan ruff around his neck and frills of lace at his wrists, with the exception being on Ireland's wild west coast, where he, quote, dispenses with ruff and frills and wears a frieze overcoat over his pretty red suit, end quote. Now, as you might have noticed, one color keeps popping up in McNally's leprechaun description, and that color is not green. It's red. And that's because only trooping fairies wear green jackets in Irish folklore. As a solitary fairy, the leprechaun essentially has a uniform which includes a jacket that is red by default. And in some northern counties of Ireland, where the leprechaun goes by the name Loriman, that uniform is an actual military uniform. And while we can certainly find a resemblance to modern leprechaun depictions in the aforementioned description, with the stockings and the breeches and the jacket and the hat, the color is wrong. Whether it's the Boston Celtics logo, which debuted in 1950, or the leprechauns in the 1959 film Darby O'Gill and the Little People, or the Lucky Charms serial mascot, which debuted in 1963, or the University of Notre Dame's fighting Irish mascot from 1964, all modern popular depictions of leprechauns have them decked out in green attire. Why'd they get rid of the red? It's simple. It made for better advertising. Well, okay, here's the full explanation. Since at least the mid-17th century, the national color of Ireland has been green, and over time, the Emerald Isle has only grown more synonymous with the color. Thus, when illustrating a leprechaun, what better way to show that it is a leprechaun from Ireland and not a gnome or what have you than by giving it green attire? The same thing happened with St. Patrick, who, in his earliest depictions, is always adorned in blue. He even has a shade of blue named after him. Unlike St. Patrick, however, leprechauns haven't just been greenwashed, they've also been cute-washed, a clear attempt by advertisers to make leprechauns appealing to children. Leprechauns from Irish folklore and mythology are lots of things, but cute they are not. That's why for all of its faults, I have to say the Leprechaun horror comedy film series, which kicked off in 1993, offers one of the more accurate portrayals of a leprechaun in the modern era. For starters, Dude is sufficiently wrinkled and decrepit looking, and his obsessions with shoes and treasure hoarding are front and center in the plot, keeping with traditional depictions. Speaking of, the idea that a leprechaun would kill to protect and or retrieve his treasure isn't that far-fetched. As W.Y. Evans Wentz wrote in his 1911 book, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, quote, the leprechaun indicates the place where hidden treasure is to be found. If the person to whom he reveals such a secret makes it known to a second person, 
the first person dies, or else no money is found. In some cases, the money is changed into ivy leaves or into furze blossoms." End quote. Yeah, leprechauns could get dark. I also get the sense that the film's writer was familiar with Alfred Percival Graves' 1909 work, The Irish Fairy Book, in which the leprechaun is described as carrying a sporon na skilling, or purse of the inexhaustible shilling, something that is loosely alluded to in the film. And then there's this notion that leprechauns can only be restrained by certain objects. In Graves' book, a plow chain or woolen thread can do the job, you can tie him up with those. In the movie, a four-leaf clover is needed, which, I mean, sure. But to clarify, leprechauns, as portrayed in Irish myth and folklore, aren't purely evil. Indeed, many scholars believe they started out as Irish gods, members of the Tua de Danann, before shrinking in the popular imagination. As Thomas Cahill explained in his 1994 book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, quote, in the foundation myth, the Tua de Danann are preternaturally skilled in building and craftsmanship. These taller, otherworldly beings eventually devolve into the little people, the fairies and leprechauns of later Irish legend, whose spirits haunt the tombs and fairy mounds they once built. The little people is a euphemism, rather like the prehistoric phrase le bon dieu, meant to disguise the speaker's fear of something unfamiliar and much larger than himself. It is possible that this flickering phenomenon of the little people represents the after glow of Irish guilt over their exploitation of more artful aborigines." End quote. The more artful aborigines Cahill is referring to here are the original Stone Age inhabitants of Ireland, who were responsible for building all of those awesome dolmens and other megalithic structures that dot the Irish landscape. While often attributed to Gaelic-speaking Druids, the Gaels didn't build those. Earlier Stone Age people did, people who had crossed over from Britain possibly when a land bridge had been present. But to be clear, those first inhabitants of Ireland were of average height for their time, if not a little taller. So despite what you may have read on Facebook, there was never a mass migration of Twa Pygmies from a landlocked region in Africa to Ireland. This is a fringe theory, it's actually more of a meme than an evidence-based theory, that always pops up around St. Patrick's Day and I already made a video debunking it. The bottom line, leprechauns are not based on flesh and blood little people. Or as Evans Wentz put it back in 1911, quote, the testimony of Celtic literature goes to show that leprechauns and similar dwarfish beings are not due to a folk memory of a real pygmy race, that they are spirits like elves. End quote. That being said, within the word leprechaun, there may be a reference to a group of real historical people from ancient Rome, the Luperci. The Luperci were essentially the stars of the ancient Roman pastoral festival, Lupercalia, held annually on February 15th. They were a priesthood comprised of youngish men who would run naked or nearly naked around Rome's Palatine Hill, striking those they encountered with thongs. No, not that kind. Or those kind. In this case, the thongs, known as februa, were narrow strips of flayed skin that they took from the animals they sacrificed. Fun! Now, what does any of this have to do with leprechauns? Absolutely nothing. That is until St. Augustine of Hippo compares the Luperci to Greek werewolves in the 5th century CE. See, the Greek werewolves are said to transform from man to wolf after taking a dip in a lake, and the point St. Augustine was trying to make was that the Luperci priests were similarly wild. On Lupercalia, they transformed. What's more, their name, Luperci, likely means something like brothers of the wolf. But when Irish scholars got their hands on St. Augustine's writings some two centuries later, something gets lost in translation, to put it lightly. The Irish scholars think that the Luperci are werewolves, or at least some kind of supernatural race that's keen on aquatic activities. Hence, when the scholars hear the tale of three mischievous sprites attempting to drag an Irish king to their home beneath the sea, as detailed in the Ulster Cycle tale The Extra Fergusa MacLeddy, or The Saga of Fergus MacLeddy, which had been passed down orally in Ireland for centuries prior to the arrival of Christianity, at least one of the scholars is reminded of those rascally Luperci St. Augustine had written about two centuries prior. In addition to dubbing the little beings Lucrepan, marking the leprechaun's first significant appearance in Irish mythology, the scholars make up a backstory, reasoning that the supernatural race of little Luperci were able to survive Noah's flood and seek refuge in Ireland on account of their being such great swimmers. Of course, this is just the latest in a long line of theories attempting to nail down a definitive etymology of leprechaun. A one Mr. Douglas Hyde, who in addition to being a linguist and folklorist was, checks notes, the first president of the Republic of Ireland, had a different theory. 
And I quote, The name Leprechaun is from the Irish Leith Brogue, i.e. the one shoemaker, since he is generally seen working at a single shoe. It is spelt in Irish Leith Brogan or Leith Frogan and is in some places pronounced Lucryman. End quote. And while Leith Brogan, spelled L-E-I-T-H-B-R-A-G-A-N, was recognized as an alternate spelling of Leprechaun in O'Reilly's Irish English Dictionary, first published in 1817, John O'Donovan's 1864 supplement to that same dictionary preferred the spellings Luprechaun, L-U-P-R-A-C-A-N, Luricon, spelled L-U-G-H-A-R-C-A-N, and Luricon, L-U-G-R-A-C-A-N. Those last two spellings are especially significant because they seem to contain within them the name of the Irish god of many talents, Lou, a cognate of the Gaulish Lugas and the Welsh Lou. And if Peter Beresford Ellis is to be believed, the god Lou is quite literally the original inspiration for the Leprechaun, both in name and form. Here's his explanation. Quote, when the old gods of Ireland were driven underground, Lou was given the she of Rodrubon by the Dagda. Over the years, this mighty god's image diminished in popular folk memory until he became simply a fairy craftsman named Lou Cromain, Little Stooping Lou, which became anglicized as Leprechaun. The Leprechaun is now all that survives of this potent patron of arts and crafts." End quote. However, it must be said that both the Little Stooping Lou and One Shoemaker etymologies are likely folk etymologies, meaning they were applied retroactively in an attempt to create alignment with what was known about leprechauns from popular stories. The, quote, true etymology of leprechaun, according to issue 256 of the Revue Celtique, is something much simpler. It comes from the Old Irish Lucre Pan, meaning little man. Similarly, Whitley Stokes interpreted leprechaun to mean small body, arguing it was composed of the Greek root lu or lagu, small, and the Latin corpus, body. Now, there's no denying that Occam's razor nudges us in the direction of these latter, simpler etymologies. Meanwhile, my love of Irish mythology and folklore draws me toward all of the other ones. But what do you think? Was the leprechaun named simply for his size? Or was he named for his occupation? For a Celtic god? Or for a group of half-naked Roman priests who were mistaken for werewolves? Leave a comment and let me know. And now that you've learned the truth about leprechauns, go grab yourself a copy of St. Patrick in your pocket and learn the truth about the so-called Apostle of Ireland. You can be sure to impress or annoy all of your fellow partygoers by keeping this primer on St. Patrick in your back pocket and busting out fun factoids like, was St. Patrick married? Did St. Patrick murder somebody? The answers are not as clear cut as you might think. As always, my name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of IrishMyths.com. Thanks for coming out.